Hello and welcome to the first edition of the Gaming Gang Video Reviews. Now, wait a second. We're not doing it like this. Hi folks, Jeff McAleer from The Gaming Gang, and greetings from sunny Mesa, Arizona. Of course, the opening was a little bit of a dig towards some of the other reviewers that you see that seemingly have to begin every episode in front of a wall of games. Longtime listeners to the show already know that I kind of poke fun at that, and I said if we ever did video reviews, we certainly would not begin by standing in front of a wall of games. Anyway, now that the little joke's out of the way, Let's get down to why we're here to take a look at Panzer from GMT. The German campaign against Russia during World War II was known by many names, depending on the nation. Notably, the Great Patriotic War in Russia, while in Germany it was known as the Eastern Front, the Eastern Campaign, or the Russian Campaign. The battles on the Eastern Front constituted the largest military confrontation in history. This was characterized by unprecedented ferocity, wholesale destruction, and immense loss of life. The campaign was decisive in determining the outcome of World War II, eventually serving as the main impetus for Nazi Germany's defeat and the destruction of the Third Reich. Some of the largest battles in history took place on the soil of Mother Russia, as Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin's forces were locked in a death struggle across thousands of miles. Moscow, Rostov, Kursk, Stalingrad, and Smolensk are just a few of the battles that have been burned into the annals of military history. The Eastern Front is the setting for GMT's latest, a reimagining of Jim Day's classic war game, Panzer. Originally published in 1979 by Yaquinto, Panzer holds a special place in the hearts of many longtime war gamers. Not only because it was one of a handful of Yaquinto titles that were actually worthy of owning, especially Day's Panzer, 88, and armor designs, but because of the detailed yet relatively fast playing tank on tank action. So is Panzer a worthy addition to your war game collection? Or has time been unkind to a design that's more than three decades old? Let's find out. Panzer is the game of small unit actions and combined arms operations on the Eastern Front of 1943 and 1944. Designed by Jim Day, it's released from GMT just this year, 2012, and it carries a manufactured suggested retail price of $72. Upon first glance at the box, you'll notice a very strong resemblance to the classic Avalon Hill game, Panzer Blitz. And that's no coincidence, because graphic designer Roger McGowan has dedicated the graphics and artwork in the Panzer series to Redmond Simonson, who did the original graphics for Avalon Hill's Panzer Blitz. So let's take a look inside the box. Upon opening the box, we're going to see that we have a variety of unit cards. These unit cards are double-sided and as you can see they're not paper they're actually board stock so very nicely done there are eight Soviet eight German and these represent various armored units as well as infantry and anti-tank weapons aircraft 16 in all and they are dual-sided we have the usual baggies from GMT, so you can store all your goodies, all the counters. There are four 10-sided dice because the series uses percentile dice. We 
We also have the rule book for Panzer, which you'll see is very lavishly illustrated. The basic rules take up all of about 18 pages, and there are loads and loads of advanced rules, as well as optional rules. Each player its game card, which will have various terrain effects, combat results, fire modifiers, unit grade modifiers, hit numbers, and so forth. So each player gets a copy of those. There are also game cards for the sequence of play, commands, a combat effects summary for each player. Each player also receives a vehicle data card key, so that explains exactly how to read the various data cards that are included. Aircraft and artillery data cards and towed data cards. So as you can see, there's plenty of add-on aids for each player. There's also the turn track, transport and summary. You can have hidden units in the game as well. We also have the counters, and the counters are 7 eighths of an inch for the vehicles. As we zoom in, you can see that the units are very easily marked, and especially for older gamers where our eyes may not be what they used to be, that helps out tremendously. Then we have the order marker counters as well as the infantry unit counters. We have various markers for knocking out tanks, showing damaged tanks, mines, terrain effects, destroyed bridges, and so on. We also have a single paper map. This I was a little surprised to see in the GMT title, simply because we're so used to seeing mounted maps. This is just plain paper, as you can see, and terrain and cities and everything else are already marked on the map itself. Personally, I think this is a real drawback that it's only a paper map simply because you are looking at a $72 game. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of folks out there who are a little upset that we simply have the paper map. The name of the game here is Tanks, Tanks, Tanks. Actually, the name of the game is Panzer, but the focus is on armored fighting vehicles. This is just a small portion of the actual game board here, and I do apologize. I've placed some plexiglass over because it is a paper board, so I'm trying to keep it down. So if there's a little bit of glare. I certainly do apologize for that. Also, in showing a bit of the board here, the forces that are opposed, the Soviet T-34s and the German Panzer IV-Gs are much, much closer than they actually would be in gameplay. At this point, they're practically at point-blank range, but I did want to be able to show the units as well. Each turn begins by each player giving their units orders. They can move. They may fire. You can place them on Overwatch. You can order them to move and fire, or fire and move, or issue no command whatsoever. Each player, of course, is going to assign its units its order at the beginning of the turn, and you would place them face down. 
you might want to put them on top of the unit, next to the unit, whatever is going to work best for you. I would probably prefer putting them next to the unit, although a lot of times you can have stacked units as well. And there's a stacking limitation of six vehicles per hex. The scale of the game is each vehicle counter represents one armored fighting vehicle or vehicle anti-tank weapon, piece of artillery, or so forth. The scale is one hex equals 100 meters. Each infantry unit is considered to be a squad or section. But in the basic game that I'm showing here, infantry does not play a role. I should point out the basic game is more of the basics as opposed to a game in itself because there isn't a whole lot going on with it. In fact, the advanced game rules take up over 40 pages, whereas the basic rules take up about 18. As far as the turn order, you'll issue your commands and then each player rolls for initiative. And it's simply enough. Rolling percentile dice, the high roller goes first. This changes quite a bit in the advanced game as actual unit experience and force cohesion has a lot to do with who's going to be able to win the initiative. Winning the initiative allows you to choose whether you're going to be the first player or the second player. Movement in the basics is fairly simple. Each unit shows for an example, 5T, that means it has a movement rate of 5 and it's a tracked vehicle. The other factors shown on the counter don't come into play in the basic game. Terrain, of course, has various modifiers to either give you more movement, such as on roads, or slow you down, going over rough terrain, hills, and so forth. After initiative comes the combat phase. And in the basics, there's only direct fire combat. Simply enough, direct fire is any unit that can see another unit could fire upon it as long as it's within range. To do so, for an example, you'll see there's various ammunition types. Armored piercing are the only ones that you'll use in the basic game. So you see that a P, S, M, L, E, those are ranges. So, point blank, short, medium, long, and extreme. Below that you see the R and the P. R is the range, P is the penetration factor for that ammunition. So if we had a T-34-76 firing at medium range between 7 and 10 hexes, that armor-piercing shell has a penetration factor of 15. To determine your chances of hitting with armored piercing ammunition, you have to take a look at the AP hit and the AP hit modifiers charts. You'll notice you have the ranges there and then you have the modifiers as well. So you'll add and subtract modifiers and then use the AP hit to look at those modifiers, cross-reference it with the range, and the numbers you'll see determine the percentile chance for you to hit. So, for an example, at medium range with a net modifier of zero, it's a 50-50 chance to be able to hit the target. In the basic game, armor penetration is very simple. Taking a look at the Soviet T-34-76, we see that... In the notes, it says armor 18 slash 12. In the basic game, there's only front and rear armor. Let's say, for an example, the Panzer IV scored a hit on the T-34 at medium range with the armor piercing shell. We can see here that it has a penetration factor of 18. We already saw the Soviet front armor is 18, the rear is 12. In the basic game, if you equal or exceed the armor by 1 to 3, you'll score a point of damage on that vehicle. If it's 4 to 9, then you've knocked it out. If it's 10 or higher, then you've brewed it up, or as we like to call it, blowed up good. If the vehicle were to be damaged, you'll place a damaged counter on it. 
and it suffers attack penalties as well as its movement is halved. If the unit is knocked out, you would place a knocked out counter instead of the unit itself, representing the wreckage that's in that hex. If you score a brew up, then you would mark with a brew up counter and that could cause smoke as well. It'll affect line of sight. The line of sight rules in the basics are pretty easy, pretty simple, and nothing overly unusual. Once each player has had a chance to direct fire based upon the first player and then the second player for units that had fire commands, then you go to movement. And once again, simply enough, units that have any sort of movement orders will be able to move on the board. Following movement, you'll have an adjustment phase and simply enough, you'll remove counters, you'll make adjustments to your turn marker and begin to go to the next turn. As I mentioned, the basics are very, very basic and there really isn't any kind of a selling point for the basic game compared to anything else out there that might be on the market. I know simply looking at counters and maps and charts isn't the most exciting thing to do. And as I had mentioned, the basic game is simply just a foundation to take you into the advanced game. The advanced game is where it's at. And there's loads and loads of additional options that really make this a true Grognard's delight. There's infantry, there's small arms, there's anti-tank weapons, aircraft, command, unit experience, army experience, initiative changes completely. There's tank armor locations, there's turret positioning, artillery, off-board artillery, indirect fire, aircraft, it's all here. And that's what really makes Panzer shine you can really see the miniature flavor within the game. And it's my understanding Jim Day originally conceived the system as miniatures rules that were then modified to create the board games. Heck, I could easily see you utilizing Panzer for micro armor. There's a lot to really like in Panzer. And of course, adding in the advanced game and the optional rules will add more crunch and more playing time and complexity to the game. I will point out that those who don't like to look up charts and to cross-reference things all the time probably will not have a great time with Panzer because you will be utilizing all those play aids quite a bit. At the end of the day, I think Panzer is a fantastic addition to any diehard Grognard's collection of war games. It's not for the light war gamer by any stretch, simply because the basics don't really have that much interesting going on to warrant a purchase there, and when you move into the advanced game, it might be beyond some people's grasp and might be a little hard to get their heads around. You can really see that this is a throwback to the late 70s, early 80s war games that I grew up with, and I really appreciate that. Although they have been streamlined a bit and the rules are much easier to understand than many of the old SPI Avalon Hill titles out there. Panzer, I have to point out, won't be for everyone. I can't see that people who are heavily invested into Advanced Squad Leader, for an example, would really want to give the system a try because they're probably already firmly entrenched in Advanced Squad Leader. This is more for the wargamer out there who's looking to take that next step to add a little more complexity to their Eastern Front World War II gaming. Say along the lines of players of lock and load titles, or say even GMT's Combat Commander series. As we've already seen, the components are top notch, except for that map. I should really get over it, but I think that single-sided paper map is a real drawback here and that does knock a, but a point off of my final grade. 
I already know there's loads more Panzer on the horizon because we have a couple of expansions that have already hit stores. Number two and number three. So there's additional maps and units included with these as well. There's even a third expansion on the GMT P500 pre-order on their website right now. I can easily see the Panzer system expanding to the Western Front or even into Africa. So there's a lot that can be mined for this system. If that's the case, what I'd really like to see GMT do is release some blank mounted maps, sort of like their Commands and Colors system, and then release hex tiles with various different terrain pieces that can be utilized. I think that would be an excellent addition in order to replace the paper maps. One of the things about the maps that I've noticed as well is that they're not very big and with the scale at 100 meters per hex, many of the units that enter the table are suddenly right within striking range to start slugging it out. There are a lot of terrain areas already on the map, but it makes everything a bit congested and I think they're artificially placed there in order to cut down on the line of sight and the available range. Other than that, I think the game components are fantastic. It's just that paper map. At the end of the day, I really like Panzer, and as I mentioned, I think it's an excellent addition to any die-hard Wargamers collection. Those of you who play lighter war games or may not want to delve into all those charts probably should take a pass. But for those of us who grew up on the Avalon Hill SPI sort of games, Panzer is fantastic. So you'll want to go over to gmtgames.com and check it out. That's it for our first video review. And I'll be the first to point out that in the future they will be much better. You got to keep in mind it took us about a year before our podcast started to actually sound professional. So obviously need a little bit of work on the lighting here too. Swing on over to thegaminggang.com for the latest news and reviews, and be sure to catch Elliot and I on our next regularly scheduled episode of The Gaming Gang Podcast. Once again, I'm your host, Jeff McAleer. Thanks for watching.